Hello, I'm Reile and today I would like to share this painting process with you while talking some nonsense. My mother took a picture of this lake several years ago. Lately I've been obsessed with fiery highlights on water and I already painted three such scenes, so I remembered this one sitting in my reference folder and decided to give it a shot. You can see the others on my DeviantArt page under the same name, and yes, some dinosaurs still use DeviantArt. I sketched the lines lightly to decide on the composition. While I'm not particularly interested in the sky, I emphasized the high horizon to focus on the waves and the reflections in water. I use Arches 640 GSM paper and soak it in water before painting. The heavy weight of this paper allows me to work wet on wet for hours, which comes in handy especially when you are someone like me with very little experience in painting wet into wet. Let me cover my palette. As the yellow, I'm using Permanent Yellow Deep from Mimory Blue. It's a fairly new pigment, as reflected by the high number in its code, PY227. It is niobium sulfur tin zinc oxide, which, judging by the chemical properties, should have excellent light fastness. It is a warm yellow in mass tone with a luminous undertone that I did not expect. And it seems to contest my thus far favorite landscape yellow, PY216. It is a very opaque whitish yellow and it's no wonder because it's basically titanium white or titanium dioxide doped with zinc and tin. I like to use PY216 for sunsets because it closely resembles the color of the sky near the horizon and it mixes well with Indian throne blue and does not create greens in your sky. It gives a wide range of sky reds and oranges with red and magenta quinacridones. This one, by the way, is PV19 Queen Red by Daniel Smith. I've had it since 2019 and it's so pigmented that I hardly see any signs of it wearing down and I use it a lot. Coming back to PY227, it seems less opaque than PY216 and thus might be more universal, but that I will have to test in future paintings. The orange I'm using here is Flame Red P073 from Rosa Gallery. This is an amazing bright orange with a cool undertone, surprisingly light fast for such a bright color, although it may fade when diluted very thinly. I haven't used Rosa Gallery paints much, but as I swatched them for my light fastness testing, I was very impressed by their organic pigments, pyrrol orange included. But most of their cobalts, their ultramarine and earth tones looked just sad, with a few exceptions. Here I'm also using Royal Brown PBR25 from Rosa Gallery for the darks. PBR25, or Benzimidazalone Brown, is a great transparent reddish brown color. If brown iron oxide seem too opaque to you, try PBR25. It mixes beautiful separating grayish violets with cobalt blue or ultramarine. I use a pastel variety of PB28 Cobalt Blue Light from Pinex Extra for the blue haze near the horizon to give more body to the color and limit its movement. Sometimes people use a transparent white for such applications, but I love using pastel versions of colored pigments as they have more character and sometimes superior light fastness than mixtures with white. I also add some phthalo blue in the water. Usually it's a good idea to use the same colors throughout the whole painting as it helps to keep the piece cohesive, but here the sky occupies a relatively small portion of the piece, so I thought I could get away with introducing a greener tone to the water in the foreground. I keep track of how much water and pigment I have on the brush compared to what is on the paper, as too much water on the brush may cause cauliflowering. If it happens, one can salvage it with a soft fluffy brush. The key is to have this brush very dry and clean, then you use it to absorb excess water and spread the rest with light sweeping motions. In the foreground, I use very concentrated paint to apply to wet paper. Here, 640 GSM paper is very helpful as it stays wet longer and allows correction. Then I painted the forest in the background. The farther we go, the lighter and bluer the trees get as the light gets scattered by the atmosphere that separates the viewer from them. Aerial perspective is a great tool for creating visual hierarchy that I am probably underusing here, at least judging by the color balance on my phone. And as you can see, I did not paint these groves very elegantly, but it will have to do. 
When painting sunsets, I usually add a red or orange outline to the background objects, or if there are thin things like power lines or cranes or fences, I paint them in red. These shores bring me to the topic of symmetry. I try to make the farther shores a bit less symmetrical than in the original image, making the left side a bit heavier to counterbalance all that is going on on the right. Symmetry tends to look odd unless you really mean it. First, I came across a great explanation of this phenomenon in a popular science book, The Telltale Brain by V. S. Ramachandran. Imagine two hills and a tree right in the middle. You might be tempted to depict it like this. Looks weird, doesn't it? This is a much more natural image. How so? Imagine this scene from above. There are just two positions that would yield the first image, but as we view it from all these angles in red, we get an image like the second one. Statistically, the second image is much more likely and we're much more used to images like this and thus they look more natural to us. Moreover, we do not just prefer the images that are the most likely, but actually err towards the most likely interpretation of what we see when there is some sort of ambiguity. This is a very powerful idea because there always is ambiguity. Think about it. When interpreting visual stimuli, we attempt to solve the so-called inverse problem. That is, we try to deduce from a set of observations the reality that produced those observations. But we do not have enough data to do so unambiguously, and we do not have direct access to the outside world, except through our senses. Imagine a small object moving slowly close to the viewer. It may project onto the retina in exactly the same way as a huge object far away moving very fast. To successfully navigate the world, we have to rely on something to resolve this uncertainty and, as I said before, we have no access to the outside world. So we choose the interpretation that supported our survival in the past as well as the survival of our ancestors. After all, all organisms that consistently chose the wrong interpretation were eaten by predators, could not find mates, or were outcompeted by their more accurate conspecifics. This mechanism works most of the time. Other times, well, we mistake the moon or bugs for extraterrestrial spaceships. If you want to explore the statistical approach to vision, I recommend taking a course in Coursera called Visual Perception in the Brain by Dale Perves from Duke University. You can also read a brief summary on his lab website, pervslab.net. Unfortunately, it hasn't been updated in a while, so you cannot see any of the optical illusions in modern browsers under the See for Yourself tab. But the Research tab is a great resource for artists explaining our uh, perception contrast, angles, distance and depth. And of course, I encourage you to dig deeper into the original publications. <sighs> that was a wild aside. Let's get back to the painting process. I let the painting dry and painted the reflections of the groves in the background. The wave surfaces that reflect the groves are the continuation of the same surfaces that face away from us towards the sun and reflect the orange lights. While the surfaces that face the viewer are the ones that get darker and darker towards the foreground. I am trying to keep track of it where it makes sense. I use one brush loaded with paint and another clean one to blend the reflections to avoid hard edges. When the painting is finished, it's time to reflect on what turned out well and what did not. This one, let's be honest, it's not my best work. I probably overdid the orange shine around the highlights and the water. Concerning the wet on wet technique, I probably got my brush a few too many times into the drying washes. The forests in the background are lazy, but well, it's my fourth painting in this technique and I am too far gone for beginner's luck and too inexperienced for reproducibility. What I do like and what makes this painting actually successful in my opinion is the fiery orange highlight in the foreground and that was the initial purpose of this work. And I think I nailed it. Let me know what you think in the comments.